Okay, first of all, thank you so much uh, for for joining me here. Um, and uh, and I already thank the powers that be about uh, everybody who had a hand in setting this up. This is really awesome. I was super excited when I was asked to uh, to do this. Um, it's it's great um, for all of you who are students. Uh, I'm going to be primarily talking to you today. I'm not going to kick the adults out, but this is going to be primarily for students. Um, there is a book that I read, which is called uh, Mindset. It's called The New Psychology of Success by a woman by the name of Dr. Carol Dweck. And uh, Carol Dweck is not a doctor of euphonium or of something like that. She is a PhD uh, in psychology, and I think she might even have like more than one PhD. This book, uh, the term life-changing gets thrown around a lot, and, uh, and I think it gets overused a lot, but this book really was life-changing. It literally changed how I changed me as a parent as a as a player as a teacher as uh, as as a husband as like as everything uh it's really crazy how this affected every aspect of my life and uh i'm going to tell you a little bit about um this this concept of a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset and then how a uh, fixed mindset is very bad and that a growth mindset is very good and about how we can have a mix of the two. Generally, people will either lean one way or the other, but we will, in general, even someone who leans towards growth mindset will have some aspects of their life that they approach that are like a fixed mindset and uh, and then other uh, other people, uh, you know, the other direction. Uh, but we can develop and learn a growth mindset, which is um, which is really important uh, to to keep in mind. Before I talk about mindset at all, I want to say that I'm going to give you a bunch of ideas of like how that you can practice better, uh, a bunch of tools of how you can practice better, and uh, some techniques and things like that. I want to be super upfront with you that uh, the times that we are living in right now, uh, as we are sitting here on April 16th, I think it is 2020, these are comp these are remarkable times. No one that you know, not your parents, not your teachers, not your grandparents, no one has lived through anything like this right now. So I am telling all of my students, I'm telling myself to, you got to be patient with yourself. And anytime that I use the word should, it's always a big red flag. Like I'm home, all of my gigs have been canceled, which they haven't like all of them. Um, so I should be getting this done. I should be getting that done, uh, et cetera. Um, I am finding that I'm having to carve out some time to just try and be like, to keep my keep myself mentally healthy right now. I've been trying to drink more water. I've been going outside and I do live in a place where it is okay for me to go outside and I'm I have not literally not been within 6 feet of another human in over a month. I'm very lucky. I've been having groceries delivered. Um but like I've been going out in the woods behind my house. Um but I, be patient with yourself and if you try some of this practice stuff and it doesn't work right away, that's okay. Just yeah, give yourself a much longer leash than you normally would and allow yourself to be a human navigating crazy times. That goes for if you're 10 or if you are uh, the ripe old age of 44 like I am. So I just wanted to say that uh, at the very beginning. So I wanted to start by defining a fixed mindset. And this is a direct quote from uh, from Carol Dweck's uh, book, which uh, is linked to actually in the um uh, in the chat. Uh, in a fixed mindset, students believe, and uh, also I want to be clear here that in her definition, students does not mean uh, high school students or it means like anyone who's learning anything. In a fixed mindset, students believe that their basic abilities, their intelligence, their talents are all just fixed traits. They have a certain amount and that's that and then their goal to uh, becomes to look smart all the time and never look dumb constantly having to prove yourself and your smarts is something that comes from having a fixed mindset, which is ex is an exhausting way to live. And I speak from experience. Um, even having a great accomplishment in life doesn't prevent a fixed mindset person from feeling that they always need to prove themselves. 
Um, let's say that you make first chair Allstate your junior year. If you have a fixed mindset, that will be completely negated if you only get third chair your senior year. So as soon as the euphoria of first chair junior year wears off, you start to sweat whether you're going to be validated again or maybe you're going to be exposed as a fraud because you did not win Allstate first chair yet again. Um, another consequence is avoiding any situation where you can be seen as not smart or gifted. Uh, anyone who has a fixed mindset will avoid playing anything in front of anyone that they won't sound great on. And I actually have a story. When I was younger, I um, I had a, quite a fixed mindset when it came to tuba. And um, I will be honest with you, I took to it very, very, very quickly. Um, as you're going to hear a growth mindset, anyone can learn absolutely anything. In fact, I'm going to jump down. It'd be better to give you that definition than I'm going to jump back up. In a growth mindset, students understand that their talents and abilities can be developed through effort, good teaching, and persistence. They don't necessarily think everyone's the same or anyone can be Einstein or Beethoven, but they believe everyone can get smarter if they work at it. It's very important to note that um, that this mindset stuff does not mean that if you play the cello enough that you can sound like Yo-Yo Ma. That's not what it's saying. But it is saying that anything that you work hard and put your mind to, that you can get better at absolutely anything. So again, uh, to, to get back to anyone who has a fixed mindset will avoid playing anything in front of anyone they won't sound great on. When I was in the seventh grade, my uh, middle school band director, whose name was, um, well, it became, ended up working for a living if he hadn't. So thank you for that, Mr. Mealy. But um, he told me that in jazz band, that he was going to, like, that this upcoming jazz band, he was, which he was already cool enough to be able to let me play a tuba in, which most band directors are, but then some say there's no tuba in a jazz band. And I'll just, I, uh, I'm, I'm told I shouldn't curse. So I'm just going to move right along. Uh, but he said, yes, come play in the jazz band. That would be awesome. So um, he told me I was going to solo, and I did what I a lot of people uh, do, is that you just hope that people over the age of 30, that they're just going to like forget that they said it, right? That was my plan, because I was terrified, because I didn't improvise. I did not improvise. He told me I was going to play a solo. I was terrified. He then, we're playing a night in Tunisia, and um, there's a kid named Chris Brownlee. Uh, who played, he plays tenor sax. The guy always sounded like John Coltrane to me. He was amazing. And then there, Brendan Collins was the trumpet player. I still remember all of this vividly. And uh, and he played and took my head. And keep in mind that a night in Tunisia is just going, is just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. And uh, and he points at me again. And then uh, I'm seeing that some people are having a problem with, uh, with things keep freezing. So just reconnect, it looks like. So hit reconnect and uh, and that should work out for you. So anyway, getting back to Mary Had a Little Lamb, um, I finally started playing Mary Had a Little Lamb over a night in Tunisia because I thought, you know what, maybe if I kind of you know goof off, he'll throw me out and then everything is going to be good. And uh, which I never got in trouble in band ever. And I loved him. But that's how scared I was for um, that is how scared I was for uh, of like not sounding good. So I thought if I was goof, you know, if I goofed off, no one would think I was trying and then I couldn't be seen as a failure. Long story short, because he was an amazing son, and then I kept going and I kept changing it, and then what do you know? By the end of it, I had taken a, um, you know, I had taken a solo, and um, and I was had the biggest smile on my face ever. But man, I was that terrified. I was absolutely, I was just. I was frozen. That's how afraid I was. Um, another, uh, but you can work through this if you've ever experienced something like that. Another consequence is that uh, even working hard is discouraged by the fixed mindset. If you have to practice something a lot, it means you weren't gifted enough in the first place to do it easily. A fixed mindset student will see another student who had a great high register right out of the box, which is something naturally you can never remove that label ever. Like that's permanent. It's like a scarlet red letter. Let's see here. IQ tests are something that fixed mindset people 
hold up as the ultimate barometer of what you were born with. Uh, but Alfred Binet, the inventor of the IQ test, uh, clearly stated that a person's IQ changes over time and is not a fixed trait. It never was intended to be the ultimate barometer of a person's intelligence. I, I, I never knew that. I had absolutely no idea, but he said that as you work and get, then that's going to change and fluctuate throughout your life. So, yeah, don't, don't, there is no number, there is no value that's going to be able to ascertain exactly what level you're going to attain about anything. Don't believe it. The effect of a mindset, of a fixed mindset on a person's life cannot be overstated. To sum it up one more time, it means constantly having to prove yourself and your smarts. It means avoiding any situation where they can, where, where you can be seen as not smart or gifted. And it even means that working hard is discouraged. Now, a growth mindset, to give you that definition again, um, in a growth mindset, students understand that their talents and abilities can be developed through effort, good teaching, and persistence. I thought persistence is important there. They don't necessarily think everyone's the same or anyone can be Einstein or Beethoven, but they believe everyone can get smarter if they work at it. A growth mindset leads to a bunch of stuff. It leads to a love of challenge. All challenges are seen as opportunities to learn and grow. In fact, you will only ever grow when you are challenged, so those opportunities are sought out. How much growth do you think that I experienced that afternoon, that after school, I think it was Wednesdays in jazz band, when I did something that I didn't think was going to go badly, I was positive that I could not do, and I did it. Oh my goodness, you can't pay for that kind of growth in a five-minute period. Um, yeah, you have to you have to seek out challenge. Uh, a growth mindset leads to belief in effort. Effort is seen as the catalyst for learning. For someone with a growth mindset, the bottom line is learning is most important, not being able to do things immediately. And so when you have a growth mindset, you say, absolutely throw me in with people who improvise better than I can, because guess what? Both Chris and Brendan had both improvised a lot more than I had. So of course they're going to be better at it. And the best way to get better at something is to get in with people who do that thing better than you. A growth mindset leads to resilience in the face of setbacks. Setbacks are the natural cost of doing business to someone with a growth mindset. Uh, it leads to greater, more creative success, Working on things you cannot do leads to the most success in life. It also creates success that is unique to you because it doesn't just reward the people who are following a pre-drawn map. As I discuss in my podcast, The Entrepreneurial Musician, the world rewards people who draw their own maps nowadays much more than people who follow maps well. And so um, this can actually lead to, um, yeah, to, to a lot more success. And it also changes what people strive for and what they consider success. Having a growth mindset means that you get to create your own rubric, which is awesome. You determine what you are striving for, which informs what you consider success for yourself. Uh, everyone needs to do me a favor, if you will, and please close your eyes and imagine that you are switching to a new instrument in band. After a few weeks, the teacher calls you to the front of the room and asks you, I want you to imagine this is happening. The teacher calls you up, to the front of the room and ask you to play something in front of the entire band. First, imagine this is someone with a fixed mindset. Your ability as a musician is on the line. Can you feel everyone's eyeballs on you? Can you see your band director's face evaluating and judging you? Can you feel the tension? Can you feel your ego waver and bristle? Now put yourself in the shoes of someone with a growth mindset. You're a novice. Of course you're not going to sound great. You just started playing the baritone the, a month ago. That's why you're in school in the first place is to learn. The teacher is a resource, not someone who's judging you. You can feel the tension leaving you. You can feel your mind opening up. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. That has always, um, that exercise is usually pretty powerful because I can absolutely feel the judgment and feel the, oh my goodness, everyone's going to judge me. And, uh, and it's completely irrational and make someone with a fixed mindset, which I used to have and still can every once in a while, avoid challenge, which is not a, 
It's not the way to a happy life. Can you all think of a class in school right now where you have a fixed mindset? Uh, did you ever say like, oh, I'm just not good at math? Uh, or like Cindy is really good at math in a way where it's like, well, yes, I'm not good at math and that's just the way it is. Or Cindy is really good at math, meaning that she has always been good at math. Those are good indicators that you have a fixed mindset about math. Now, to reiterate, I am not saying that everyone is equally as good at math, right? I had a couple of friends who ended up going and like, uh, you know, I had friends who went to different Ivy League schools to major in things like engineering and, and mathematics. And I, I was really good at math when I was in school. I was not as good as those people were. And that's okay. And it might have been because I, they worked harder than me. And I do think that that's part of it. But they were also just better at math than me. The point is that I don't have to be terrible at anything and then just say, I can't dance or I don't have a good singing voice or I'm not good at math. The message is you can change your mindset. Uh, I failed is an observation of a singular event, which is, of course, the growth mindset. I am a failure is a judgment. That's really important. I failed means that I tried to do this thing and it didn't end up working out versus I am a failure is I tried this and that kind of thing never works out. I always suck at math. I'm a failure. Those two things are um, are very, very different. Um, I see a question from Dave here that in your experience, can you possess both um, you know, shades of both? Absolutely, you can. I do feel that people tend to, you know, fall, you know, to lean either growth or fixed mindset. But uh, there are absolutely some things that I still think about a f that with a fixed mindset. Dancing is one of them. And uh, there is no reason. And I'm not a horrible. I'm not like uh, put it on, uh, you know, put it on YouTube and like laugh hysterically for millions of views bad at dancing. But I'm not a great dancer. But guess what? I've never worked on. I've literally never looked at a single YouTube video on how to get better at dancing. I have, as all musicians do, I have great time. Uh, I have great rhythm. I can feel groove. I mean, there's I, I could get significantly better at dancing, not to the point where you'd see me at a wedding and go like, that guy's an amazing dancer, but I could get a lot better at dancing. That's something that I have a fixed mindset. Absolutely. Um, but in general, I think I, I actually have to I, I have to say that I have a growth mindset for the most part. And a big part of it is because of reading this book. Uh, the effect of having a growth mindset um, also cannot be overstated on someone's life. And again, like I did for the fixed mindset, let me just sum up the bullet points here. There's a love of challenge. There's a belief in effort. There's a resilience in the face of setbacks. There's greater, more creative success. And it changes what people strive for and what they consider success. Let's see here. I see another question from Troy. Where in your tuba playing have you noticed fixed mindset creep in and how did you begin to overcome it? Um, that's a that's a really good question. This is perfect. And then I'm going to uh, launch into the practicing part of this. I'm not going to go too long today because when I was in uh, when I was like a high school student, if somebody was like, I'm going to talk to you for 90 minutes about mindset and practicing, I would have been like later, dude. So um, anyway, um, there's absolutely parts of my tuba playing that I have noticed that a fixed mindset can creep in. Um well, one of them, I talked about improvising before and about how that breakthrough that I had in 1987, um, I was um, I was honored to take the stage with the uh, the United States Army Blues and with Swamp Romp, which is a part of uh, of the Army Blues at the uh, Army Tuba Euphonium Workshop uh, this past um Jesus was only two months ago, and it, it feels like it was literally feels like it was years ago. Um, but I was on stage with um, I was on stage with some of the best jazz musicians in the world, and we wrote charts that like you know that put me at my best, etc. But like I will tell you that um, they asked me to do it, and then it turned out they were on tour for last year's Army uh, workshop. So I would actually ended up getting asked like I don't know twenty months before it started because they skipped a year uh, because they were the the ensemble was on the road. Otherwise, it's like an every year thing that there's two soloists with the Army Blues, and I put off really starting to work towards that gig 
for a very long time because I was scared. I was scared and I felt like I didn't belong on that stage. And like what I do with the improv thing and with baselines and things like that, I can do really well, but it's like what I do. And I've done a lot of what I do and then getting out of that comfort zone. Um, I was absolutely bringing a fixed mindset to that while I was giving this presentation to students and to band directors all the time. And, um, and, and uh, yeah, procrastination is a good sign of fear. That is exactly right. And uh, my, there's an author by the name of Seth Godin, who if uh, you have ever listened to the entrepreneurial musician, you've heard me, I mentioned his name like seven times in like a, in a five minute uh, episode. My wife calls him my spirit animal, but he talks about how, um, about how at some point the fear of not doing the thing outweighs the fear of doing it poorly. And that's when you launch into action. And so even knowing all of this stuff and about about fear and about uh, the fixed mindset and worrying about how I was going to look, et cetera, I was still putting it off. Now, do you, I certainly wasn't putting it off with this kind of specificity in my head or else I would have seen right through that. I just like I had other things to do. Right. Um, I always had other things to do or other things to practice. And then I had a breakthrough a few months beforehand. And I put the pedal down and I had a blast and it was my dream scenario because um, I, I want to try and say this without sounding obnoxious. But once you're in the music business for a really long time, it's not all that common to be on stage and be surrounded by people that are always, you know, that are all better than you, uh, if you will. And this was uh, this was one of those times where every one of those people live in that jazz ecosystem all the time. And I visited it for a night and it was one of the most rewarding uh, nights uh, of my career, which was, um, yeah, which was really good. All right, I'm seeing one more question. Yes, Seth's blog is incredible. It's seths.blog is where you can find it. Or you could even just Google Seth. Literally, the word Seth will get it to you, uh, get you to it. It's a daily blog. Uh, one more question, then I'm going to get into the practicing tools. Um, let's see a question from Gerald. How did you get to the point you are at with the tuba, knowing that there's always someone at a higher level than you? How did you overcome it? Great question. Um, when I was younger, I just didn't acknowledge that anyone was at a higher level than me. No, I don't actually mean that, but, um, but anyway, anyone who's known me a long time is laughing right now. Um, I, I was confident as a young man. We'll just say that. Um, but, um, but the, um, there is always someone who is better than you at a thing. There just is. And I, I can't I can't imagine if I was like by far and away the best thing at, at, at the best at anything in the world. Talk about boring. Um I uh, I have played so much in brass quintets that I'm really good at it. I've played thousands of uh, of concerts, you know, probably I don't know, 2000 brass quintet concerts including like master class performances. Uh you do that that long, you're really good at it, but then I hear I hear recordings of Sam Palafian who I used to who's my mentor, who I used to see. I sat in on their rehearsals all the time. I saw it with my own eyes. But it's like, wow, there's still a standard that I'm chasing. Um, uh, and I hear John Fletcher recordings of him. And, you know, it's like it's and nowadays graduate students at really good programs can do insane things on the tuba, insane things in terms of technically, um, which that's not a big priority for me right now. I am not. Um, I am not trying to push the boundaries technically uh, for myself on the tuba. Um, and that doesn't mean I'm not trying to push things, but I'm not trying to be the person that the world calls to play the next most difficult uh, technical solo. That's just not really where my, um, that's not where my interests lie right now. And so part of it is, um, and I, I don't say this for ego reasons, but I, um, Sergio Carolino is a tuba player who as a tuba operator, there is a lot of things that he can do way better than I can. He's also a brilliant artist. He's amazing. He's one of my heroes. But he can do a bunch of that stuff because uh, he kept the pedal down when I let up because I got interested in other things. And he has not, um, he, to my knowledge, doesn't do music business consulting as a part of his living, which is something I'm really passionate about. He doesn't host a podcast. He doesn't whatever, and he's got his own hobbies. But I, you can't be as good as everybody else at everything ever. You just cannot be as good at Tom Holtz 
uh, of like playing bass lines and soloing on a tuba when you don't live in that ecosystem all the time. You cannot be as good as Mike Roylance of the Boston Symphony Orchestra is at playing the orchestral tuba when you don't live in that ecosystem full time like he does. And so, um, yeah, I, I don't really compare myself to others. And I realize that some of that is a little bit of privilege because I have regularly uh, had people tell me for a long time now that they really uh, that say nice things about my playing and about my teaching and uh, since I'm out in public. So I already have that and I can understand it can be harder than that. But I have priorities that um, that that I I want to do a whole bunch of things in life and I'm not a slave and needing to be as good as Sergio at playing tuba solos because that doesn't jive with the rest of my, again, I get to make my own rubric, right? I get to draw my own map and my map is there's a lot of overlap with Sergio's, but there's also a lot of, um, you know, there's, there's, there are differing parts of that. And also to be clear, I'm not saying I would be as good at Sergio is if I spent as long as he did, cause that's not how this works. Um, I'd be a heck of a lot closer to him, but, um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. So hopefully that answers your question, Gerald. All right, let's get into, uh, let's get into the practicing. Um, bringing a growth mindset into the practice room is an amazing experience. Bringing a fixed mindset in the practice room is not a pleasant experience at all. Um, here are some tips and tools for how to practice better. And this goes for if you are, if you're 12 years old or if you are a professional like me, all of the same principles, they, they all apply. Um, keep in mind that a, a growth mindset leads to better practicing. And then also keep in mind that better practicing helps to lead to a growth mindset. It's a vicious cycle. And once you start to do it, uh, it's, uh, it, it's really, really, um, it's, it's great. It's awesome. It's exciting when you can get a healthy mentality in the practice room and then you start to do it more and then it goes better and then you have more fun and then that makes you practice more, which makes you better, which means it's more fun, uh, you know, et cetera. It's a, it's a wonderfully vicious cycle. Um, there is, if you imagine, last week Pat had this beautiful like presentation and a deck and all that. I don't have that. So uh, the uh, imagine, if you will, half a pie chart. Over here, we've got boredom. Over here, we've got frustration. And then in the middle, we've got this sweet spot that's between boredom and frustration. The key to practicing successfully is surfing in between. It's in that sweet spot in between boredom and frustration. So the question then is, when we are bored, what do we do? When we're frustrated, what, what do we do? And so let me talk about that a little bit. If you are bored, raise your standards. Let me repeat that because the first time that I heard that, we were on the road in Hong Kong and I heard another teacher actually share that. And I like immediately pulled out my phone and wrote that down in a hurry. If you are bored, raise your standards. What do I mean by that? There are a lot of tuba players right now, I bet, who are listening to me who will occasionally, no matter how amazing your band director is, will occasionally get bored in band because the tuba parts are a lot easier than the flute or clarinet parts. And so a lot of times it can feel like we are sitting there and we are just kind of uh, allowed to eavesdrop on a on a group flute uh, lesson, you know, or rather the you know, sectional, I guess, is the word that I was looking for. Um, if you are if you're bored as a tuba player in band, raise your standards. What do I mean by that? Do you know how hard it is to play an eight bar crescendo of just playing umpa, just bum bum bum? Bum, 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 with a, an eight bar crescendo, 16 consecutive notes. Do you know how insanely difficult it is to play 16 consecutive notes? Let's say it's going from piano up to forte. Do you know how hard it is to play 16 notes where every single note is slightly louder than the note that came before it and is slightly less loud than the note that comes after it and that there's not even two notes that are at the same dynamic? To do that for 16 straight notes is really difficult, and a little of it is difficult here. It's mainly difficult right here underneath my coronavirus haircut here or a complete lack thereof, which anyone who knew me in college and hasn't seen me since then is like, actually, it looks like he just got a haircut because I used to look like a mess 
all the time, but that's a that's a different uh, topic. So if your board raise your standards, how the difference between good players and great players, this goes within your high school band, the difference between uh, a good player in a high school band and a great player in a high school band is not a few really big things. Notice I'm not saying a bad player and a great player. I'm saying a good player and a great player. A good player can play all the right rhythms. They can play the dynamics. They can play. Uh, they can play a lot of that stuff. The great player, it's like there's like a hundred little things that are just a little bit better for that great player. Maybe her articulations are just a little bit better. Maybe um, her ability to sustain loud with a great sound um, is just a little bit better. And so if you can start to pay attention to what all those little details are and then try to, uh, you know, to, to make that happen, then you are going to get unbored, which um, I don't know if that's a word or not, um, but I teach college. So I think I should just say it like it is and then people don't question it. Right. So you will get unbored quickly. So, um, yeah, it's really important. Also, if you get bored, one thing that gets me um, board quickly is when I practice for time. Now, if you have timesheets in your band program, uh, I am not telling you to not turn them in, but, um, I need to, um, I need to beg you to not practice for time. And, and when I, what I mean by that is to practice for goals. We're going to talk about goal setting here in just a second, but whenever I practice for time, um, it never ends well for me. And um, this was a while ago now. This was maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. We were on tour, Boston Brass on tour in Tokyo, and we stayed at a, um, at a hotel that actually catered to Western business travelers and uh, specifically to performing arts organizations. There was like a ballet that was there, including a whole ballet orchestra. There was another orchestra. The ballet was from Russia. Anyway, there were like a lot of per performers there. And they actually had two Wenger practice rooms in the basement of this hotel. It was obviously a very big hotel. Um, I signed out. You had to sign out for a time, and I hadn't played in a couple of days because it takes a day and a half to get there, and um, I needed to practice, and I signed up for like an hour. And granted, I was a little bit tired, but I, I did the thing where I was going to practice for an hour, and I played a bunch, and I thought it had been like – I thought it had been like 35 minutes or something. And I looked at my watch and it had been 11 minutes. I thought it was 35 or so. I thought it was at least a half an hour. It could have been 45 minutes. It was 11 minutes because I did not have any goals whatsoever. All I was trying to do was fill an hour's worth of time playing the tuba. And I was so dejected that I literally just like put the horn in the case and I went um, and put it in my room. And then I went and ate uh, sushi at a conveyor belt place right down the street. Um, I cannot practice for time it gets me so bored so fast so but when i have specific things that i'm trying to work on which we're about to talk about then time flies it's the exact opposite problem it's like if you think about your least favorite subject in school then i bet the clock goes really slowly and if you think about your favorite subject in school the the the, the time goes really 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 quickly Okay. Uh, if you are frustrated, so we talked about board, raise your standards. If you are frustrated, break it down to a more manageable chunk, whatever that is. This is really important. Uh, and, and all of this stuff, there's literally never been a single original thought that has ever fallen out of my mouth. So I got this all from someone else. I don't remember who told me this, but I'm so happy that they did, which is that sometimes we can treat the tool, the practicing tool of slowing down whatever we're working on, it's as if we have a toolbox and we bring it into the room and we open it up and there's one tool in the box, which is just slow it down. And that's a really good tool. But if you need a saw, a hammer is not going to do the job, right? So slowing down is a great tool, but don't use it as the only tool. Isolate things like, say, fingers only. You can really hear the groove of a, uh, of a fingers only passage and whether your fingers are exactly right or exactly wrong. You can tizzle the rhythm of something. You can do a wind pattern. You can sing the line. You can play the rhythm on one pitch. Da, 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 da. Especially if it's a more complicated uh, rhythm than what I just did. You can then do the phrasing on just one pitch. Da, 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 da. Whatever the, the difficult thing is, you are going, and then you, 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 uh, 
you isolate it and then you you slowly but surely build it back up in you have to by the way at the first thing you have to do which we leads beautifully into the next thing uh is you have to identify what it is that's not working and then identify why it's not working and then attack that specific thing there there is something called the the uh pareto principle um and uh, pareto was a uh was an italian economist from a long time ago and it's also called the 80-20 rule, and it, it applies to lots and lots and lots of things um, in the world. But the 80-20 rule is that if you spend 80% of your time on the 20% that you can't do, then your um, your playing is going to absolutely take off. Uh, you need to identify where that 20% is and then start there, which means that you should very rarely start at the beginning of whatever piece you are working on. If your band director is good, you will start to notice that that um, they do not start the pieces at the beginning every single time. In fact, they will not actually that often start at the beginning because if the main problem is in measure 17, they are going to recognize that they don't need to play the first 16 measures to get there. Now, um, there's sometimes there are plenty of reasons to start at the beginning even when it's at 17. I'm oversimplifying on purpose, but the point is go straight for it. I can't tell you how many etudes are set up in this format where there's like an opening section and there's an opening statement and then it comes back and it's just a little bit harder and then there's the B section which has a lot of accidentals and is a is a lot harder and then we um we, it'll then swing back around to the the top again I can't tell you how many times I've had lessons with unprepared students like over the years. My Shenandoah students are always so prepared. This never applies to any of them. But uh, where they will start and then like when it gets to the, the hard section, which is usually like, say, the third quarter, then it will... Um, then it, it will not go that well. They need to start. You need to start at that spot and then identify. You The first step is identifying that it's the hard part. Then you figure out what is hard about it. And if it's that, um, if it's the rhythms, then again, isolate the rhythms. When you tizzle something, you take air, you take inhale and exhale basically out of it. You take the fingers out of it. You take high notes and low notes. You take dynamics. You take all of this stuff out of it. You isolate just the rhythm. Then you build that up by playing it just on one one note and at a at a middle dynamic right um and then if it's fingers then you add the right notes but again at a middle dynamic so maybe it's pianissimo or you eliminate the pianissimo you just slowly go back to build this thing back up and then and slowing down is a very is a, is a great tool um uh, but don't just like bulldoze your way through and start at the top. And that is a good way to get frustrated also because every time that you're going to get to the hard part, it's not going to sound very good, which again, healthy practicing fosters a growth mindset, which is a growth mindset will lead to healthy practicing. It's chicken or egg. You got to start somewhere, but also continuing to make the same mistakes over and over again because you start at the top and then you get all the way down to the bottom uh, or three quarters of the way through. That also leads to the fixed mindset, which you then avoid practicing to begin with. So, all right. I see another question here, uh, which is from Doug. Sometimes if you have a growth mindset, does it come out like a cop out? Well, if we practice as hard as them, we would be just as good as that group or person. That's a that's an interesting that's a really interesting question. Um, I suppose that it could. I try to um, uh, and and that's you know what what's that's actually a fixed mindset approach that's masked as a growth mindset uh, because a fixed mindset person says um, that um, that well. There's a couple of ways that a fixed mindset can manifest itself. You can say, "Oh, she she has a, a great high register," implying that uh, that she was literally born with a great high register on the clarinet and could just play above the break with effort the first time she was handed a clarinet, which is almost surely a hundred percent false. But then the um, the other way is that you can say that she worked at it and that if you had worked at it, that you would be just as good, which is just fear. Right. It was mentioned in the chat earlier. That is fear. And um, and th that's one of those shoulds, even though the word should doesn't actually appear there where um, 
I I try to not deny reality, right? I am as good of a parent as I am, and uh, this is the first time I've ever done it, and I've never had a kid who's five years and 10, well, no, and 11 and a half um, <laughs> months old, uh, and so I'm doing the best that I can, and oh, well, if I had been a, te- a parent for longer, or if I'd been a teacher for longer, or if I had done more work on the tuba, I don't... Uh, that's a trap because anytime I'm comparing myself to others is a trap and that's a good indicator that I'm using a fixed mindset. But then also uh, we are not entitled as it says, um, I think it even says right in the definitions that we are not all Beethoven. Um, Yes, it does. uh, The Einstein or Beethoven. I knew that was in the book. I couldn't remember whether it was in the quote I read. Um, And there's no way that we ever can be, but it is very empowering when we realize that we can get better if we do it. Right. I conduct once a year um, and uh, and I conduct at the uh, at the Kennedy Center. Thank you very much. What you're feeling is impressed. Uh, It's tuba Christmas. It's not exactly they, they it's my wingspan. I have very, very long arms. And so that's why I have been hired to conduct tuba Christmas at the Kennedy Center. And I keep rehearsal moving and I keep it fun. I think that those are the three reasons. I like to joke with my wife, who is a, um, I am obviously very biased, but I am, uh, she's a rock star middle school band director. Um, and I like to, she who has guest conducted from uh, Mississippi, all state to, to Maine, to Florida, to all over the place. She's like a real conductor. She's, she's awesome. Um, and I, I like to joke with her that they would all hire me, but they know the word is out that I only conduct on the main stage at the Kennedy Center, and she just rolls her eyes and shakes her head at me, which is exactly the response that I was looking for. So, um, But guess what? I would get a lot better if I, um, if I conducted more than once a year. And I've even gotten better in the four or five years that I have done Tuba Christmas at the Kennedy Center, but there's absolutely no guarantee that I would be as good as my wife is at conducting because she's really good. She can say so much with her with her hands, with her facial expressions, with her her rehearsal rhythm. Like I mean, everything is like because she's been doing it for decades. Even if I had the time to be a, even if I had the decades to spend that long, um, I might be better than her. I doubt it. I definitely am not saying that I would be as good as her either. So we all just do what we can. And we realize that there's room for growth, but we are not entitled to any results whatsoever. So um, to, to kind of wrap this up um, is that you need to do everything you can to bring a growth mindset into the practice room with you, which means that r- recognize it for what it is. Recognize it that this is a challenge. And that, by the way, if it's not a challenge, that means you're bored and you need to raise it um, uh, really softly. That's a bad example because it's actually really easy to play the clarinet really softly. And I'm very jealous. Um, the key to playing the trombone, uh, you know, like past like fourth position in tune is playing the trombone past fourth position a lot, right? Um, you you just you have to learn by doing. Recognize that you need to be seeking out the challenge, uh, that you need to uh, believe in effort. You need to realize that a setback means that you are um, that you're on the right path. Actually, um, when you're setting goals for yourself as a as a practicer. Uh, This goes for your band director, by the way, planning rehearsals. This goes for everybody. If you are planning uh, goals for yourself, like a specific goal, like I am going to be able to play measures 9 through 16 at quarter note equals 110 uh, by this coming Friday. That's a nice specific and measurable goal. You can either do it or you can't. Well, obviously, if you always, uh, if excuse me, if you never, reach your goals in the allotted time, then you're not very good at setting goals. Um, however, this also go is true. The flip of that, if you always attain your goals in the allotted time, then you're not very good at goals. You should get into that because if you always do, you're going to be in the boredom side of things, right? So you need to be living in uh, in that sweet spot. And I see one last question. I'm kind of out of time, but I'm going to get to this one last question from uh, from Sam. How can we overcome constantly comparing ourselves to others when so many music events are competition based? Boy, I I should not have answered one more question because this is like this is a lo- this can be a long one because part of it is philosophical. 
it can be really, really, really hard to Sam just nailed it, right? This is the question. When we're constantly getting judged, when we're getting rated, when there's a winner and there's a second place and there's a third place, um, and I am not opposed to competitions in music. I'm really not. Uh, I'm a huge sports fan. I love the fact that um, that when the season isn't postponed or canceled, and I'm going to try not to cry, but at the end of every baseball season, one city gets to have a parade, and then there's 29 cities who get to watch the parade on on their TVs. I love that. There's something about that. Um, you know, but in music, I think there's a place for it, but I do think that we go way too far with it at times. And especially because sometimes those competitions are individual and sometimes they are group. So what you need to realize is this. Um, and let me rephrase that. What we all need to realize is um is is this um is that um we the word should is, again, is one of those red flags. Another red flag for me just on a human level is when I am getting upset about things that I cannot control, okay? Um, a competition, I have absolutely no control over what the other people do right? You don't have any control over how well anyone else plays or who shows up or what the judges are, are valuing. Um, the other thing is, so in that sense, you can just prepare as much, and thank you for this question, Sam. It's awesome. Um, you can, there is a certain confidence that comes from knowing in your the pit of your stomach that you did everything that you possibly could to prepare for this audition for this competition for this whatever and then you just do your best and then you chalk it up as a learning experience if you win you chalk it up as a learning experience if you lose you chalk it up as a learning experience but you also need to understand something i interviewed a um a, a filmmaker actually a documentary filmmaker for the entrepreneurial musician it was all about actually performance anxiety stuff but he said that he was editing this film that he uh, that he put together literally until 4:30 in the morning when the premiere of this movie was at 10 a.m. So he ended up getting like three hours of sleep and he had to stop editing and he would have still edited if it had been a week later. Well, he finally had to just say this is done because it has to be done. And he was able to come to peace with that because he realized that that was not a judgment. However, that film came out and it was critically acclaimed and it won tons of awards. So there's like a happy ending there. But however it was received was not a, a complete rundown of how he was as a filmmaker. If it was great, it doesn't mean he's a great filmmaker. If it was bad, it doesn't mean he's a bad filmmaker. What he realized was that that was a snapshot of exactly what uh, of how he was as a filmmaker at that moment. And you never know what everything's in the eye of the beholder, right? I hope that everyone has gotten a ton out of this session, but there is, um, it's basically impossible that every person that clicks on this is going to make it all the way to the end and say, I'm going to see every single thing that Andrew Hitz ever does online ever again because that changed my life. There's going to be a couple of people who are, you know, who are not fans at all, who disagree, whatever. All I can do is prepare, which I did, and then do the best job that I possibly can and then uh, move on from there. And this is a snapshot of me as a teacher. I also don't have a lot of experience with looking at the chat while also looking at, um, you know, at the at the thing. And and so and I've done it. I think this is the second time I've done it. And it's a little bit more natural than the first. But if I did this, if every time that I spoke to my college classes, this was going on, I would be even better at being able to navigate. And, I, and it might inform how I organize my lecture to begin with, et cetera. Um, but you know, I'm doing the best that I can. And some people might, you know, like I stumbled a couple times in the middle cause I didn't quite know what to say next. Cause I was kind of switching back and forth. Some people might get upset by that. Like I'm okay with that. I did the best that I can. And I'm going to be even better the third time that I do this, um, this setting. So that's, um, and that was kind of a long and kind of a non answer because it, it's hard. It's like, well, when we anoint a winner and a loser, um, yeah, it can be hard to say, well, you just need to grow, but just do your absolute best, both in preparation and in, in the execution of it, and then learn from it. And then just keep reminding yourself why you're doing music in the first place, which is that we all love it and that we have a passion for it. And, uh, otherwise you would have quit band or you would have quit teaching band, um, or you would quit being a professional tuba player. And, um, 
yeah, it's just a snapshot of where we're at on, on that day. Um, and uh, and even just at that moment of that day, it might go differently an hour later or an hour earlier. We'll never know. So thank you so much to all of you for showing up. Thank you to everybody for um, for asking questions. It was awesome. I didn't see all of them uh, as they went by, although um, I, I got a little bit of help there. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you to everyone here at the um, at the night, uh, you know, at the at the international um oh boy i should have had this in front of me the uh, music education summit um and um and also to jupiter band instruments and to xo brass for having me here if any of you ever have any um any questions for me um i am getting inundated with emails right now like from school and bringing online and all of that stuff um then uh so there might be a delay but if you go to andrewhits.com then uh you can um absolutely um, you know, click the email link there, and uh, I'm on Facebook because uh, I'm old, and I'm on uh, Twitter and I'm Instagram, so you you can find me. So thank you very much uh, for um, I almost I almost signed off for my podcast, and that is going to do it for another episode of the Entrepreneurial Musician, which is not what this is. So anyway, thank you all very much, and uh, yeah, take care, stay safe, and um, yeah, be well. Cheers. Now I'm catching up on all your messages. Thank you for having your students watch, Patty. That's awesome. I do recall the uh, solo spit valve, uh, Robin. That was uh, that was funny. That was very funny. Love it. Yeah, compare yourself to where you were before not comparing with others is really good. What's up, Tobin? Now he's answering me, but I, I can't hear you, Tobin. <laughs> Comparisons and competition are a part of nearly every profession or aspect of life. You can't control who you are being compared to or all aspects, the perception of those making the comparison. Bring your best to be satisfied that you did. Yes, very well said, Chris. Yeah, very well said. There we go. Cool. Thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your attention. There's a lot of places that you could be uh, sending that. So, um, and you can, uh, yeah, send questions to contact at musicedsummit.org. Cheers. Cheers.